how do archaeology and the Bible relate to one another? Earlier I said that there was a phase early on in archaeology where they were primarily looking for treasures, treasure hunters. There was also a phase early on uh, in the early 20th century, early to mid 20th century, where they saw the purpose of archaeology was just to prove, like in the Middle East, was just to prove the Bible. It can do that, but that's not the focus of archaeology, and it shouldn't be. And the reason I say it shouldn't be is because you have an agenda there that determines what you find. It influences how you interpret what you find if you're not careful. Because as human beings, we're not as objective as we think we are. And if our purpose is to prove the Bible is true, then as we discover things, sometimes we make it fit. So, there are various uses of archaeology, I think, that are very important. One, in terms of how it relates to the Bible, it illustrates the Bible. It throws light on the Bible. When you learn how people live, that just adds a lot to some of these stories in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. Some of them are just little details, cultural, um, ethnic kinds of things that are just interesting to know, but also helps to have a better understanding of what's going on. And sometimes what we find does confirm the Bible's historical picture. The, not only the descriptions, but kind of the timeline, that sort of thing. Uh, the description in Exodus, on the Exodus, the travels from Sinai to Canaan, some of those are very accurate in terms of geography and all that kind of stuff. And that's very good to know. So a lot of times it does corroborate what we have in the Bible and those stories. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes it helps us with comparative approaches. It helps us to see parallels, similarities with ancient Mesopotamian kinds of things. Just yesterday uh, in my Old Testament survey class, I was talking about the, uh, the law code of Hammurabi. Fascinating parallels. You, you do this too, Terry. That's right. Yeah. Same schedule, <laughs> almost. But fascinating parallels between the Law Code of Hammurabi and the Old Testament. In fact, the stone that the Law Code of Hammurabi is found on, seven foot black stone, circuit. The Law Code is written all the way around at the top. Robbie is receiving the law from God, their God. It was assumed in the Middle East their laws came from their gods. Now that's, to me, that's exciting. Because it's exactly where Israel is. It's exactly their perspective. They're not that different from the people around them in some ways. Other ways, yes. Other ways they were supposed to be, but they weren't. <laughs> um, and it shows how Israel has influenced or was influenced by their neighbors. Why would we expect anything different? We're influenced by our neighbors and we influence our neighbors. That's the way it was with Israel in the past. And sometimes they were influenced too much by their neighbors. Another, well, some of the primary purposes is Proves our knowledge of the world of the Bible, helps us to understand how people live in biblical times, and uh, relationships between Israel and her neighbors. Sometimes they were good, sometimes they were bad. Archaeology can help confirm a lot of that. With discoveries not only in Israel, but ancient Mesopotamia, Syria, those kinds of things. And directly and indirectly, all this can help us. Secondary purposes. Archaeology has confirmed hundreds of places mentioned in the Bible. And we take that for granted. But that's very important. That these places are real. They're there. Um, and I have here 
that side of the project there decided they, they've been digging since 1990 91 something like that they decided 20 years ago 25 years ago this is the city of Bethsaida on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee okay they've not found the uh, sign yet, the population sign outside the city. <laughs> when you find something like that, that's extremely important. But they've argued their case. Other archaeologists come along and say, no, based on our reading of the Gospels, that site should be closer to the Sea of Galilee. And there's another site that's just been excavated in the last three years that's going to be a continuing station that they say no, this is that side. So it's going to be interesting to see which way history goes. You know, I'm around that long enough. Sometimes these things take a long time. But both sides are arguing. No, this is that side. Three, four of the apostles are from that side. It's a fishing village on the northern shore of Galilee. So sometimes the debate continues. Didn't the University of Nebraska at Omaha have a big extensive thing in there? And yeah. They said, we found what's called the Fisherman's House, which they maintain may have been Peter or Andrew's home. Yeah, that's what they've argued. Yeah. And this other project now is saying, no, that's something else. This is that side. <laughs> so, yeah, the debate goes on. Uh, references to names of biblical people. Now, does that mean it was specifically that person? Not necessarily, but it tells us the names of the people in the Bible were fairly common names. Um, David, Ahab, Jehu, Jeremiah, Hezekiah, Pontius Pilate, and on and on and on. Now, the description of David um, it was found up at uh, Dan, way up to the north. Um, the house of David is referred to. That's the earliest recording or discovery of the name David outside of the Bible. And reference to the house of David suggests dynasty. Because it's some years, a century or so after the time of David, but it's still referring to his uh, or the kingdom of Israel. Since he was one of the early kings, that's how they saw that. Uh, can confirm identity of people. It's a story of the Hittites you may have heard for a long time. Scholars thought the Hittites were just made up. No one knew where they were, knew where they had been. Nothing had been discovered of the Hittites civilization. So, 18th, 19th, early 20th century scholars said, no, the Bible just made it up. And all of a sudden, in the central areas of Turkey, they came across a city, another city, another city that had a similar language. They didn't know what the language was, they'd never seen it, and a lot of other kinds of things, which they finally, several decades in the making, decided, hello Hittites, <laughs> these are the Hittites. So things like that do happen. Uh, the origins of the Philistines, People have, you know, have argued back and forth and all of that. And Amos tells us, and Caftor, other places, across the Mediterranean, the Aegean area. And that's where they're finally realized, okay, yeah, they did. They, they did. Sometimes, archaeological discoveries challenge our understanding of the Bible. Like at Jericho. Or the city of Ai, or I. Um, some say at Jericho, there's no evidence there of what happened in the, what's described as happening in the Bible. That the archaeological evidence just does not support it, and that there wasn't a city at that particular time that had already been destroyed long before, and the story could have happened that way. Similar kind of thing at Ai. Those were two cities you know, the Israelites attacked when they first came into the land of Canaan under Joshua. Well, 
The idea is, if we can't find the evidence, that didn't happen, right? No, that's a fallacy of absence of evidence. Because absence of evidence doesn't mean that something didn't happen. It just means that we haven't found the evidence. Maybe we're looking in the wrong place. In fact, there's been a recent project that says archaeologists have thought AI was over here, but in reality it's over here. And they're excavating a new area, and they're finding some very interesting things from that very period of time. Of course, the word AI means ruin. People may have been living among ruins. And they say the city existed long before Joshua ever came along and was already destroyed. Well, if that's what the city name means, maybe that's what they were doing. My point is, sometimes archaeology challenges us to rethink our understanding of Scripture. Who says our understanding of scripture is always accurate? And sometimes archaeology matches our understanding of scripture. And sometimes archaeology challenges to rethink how we look at scripture. They don't necessarily contradict each other. It's just sometimes we don't have all the answers that we would like. It's kind of an interesting relationship. Yeah, Frank? Yeah. I wrote something somewhere relative to Jericho, that one of the digs, I think it was Kenyon, if I remember right. Yeah, Catherine Kenyon. Yeah, that she decided, okay, she found evidence of fire. Okay, that, that, that Pardon, she ev found evidence of fire. Evidence of fire, okay. okay. But she said, this can't be the fire, the, the laws crashing the fire in, in the Old Testament, because we can't, we didn't find pottery that would have dated to that period of time. Subsequently, another archaeologist said, well, well hang on, the area you're digging in probably wasn't the right socioeconomic level to have that kind of pottery. It probably is that kind of pottery across town. So these yeah. things can get really complicated. It does. Yeah. It does. And not anyone has the whole picture. Right. I think sometimes we just have to be patient and try to look at all the different the evidence that does exist that we do have. Yeah, it seems like every archaeologist redefines what happened to Jericho. Yep. Interesting thing about archaeology is they never dig the entire site. You expect them to, at least we would, they don't. They never dig 100% what's there. They haven't dug 100% what's in Jericho or anywhere else. Part of the main reason for that is they dig part of it with the knowledge that archaeology will continue to develop as a science. New tools, new excavation methods, and so forth. And the next generation will have a lot better chance to come back and excavate in a different place in that site and have a much better picture. That's exactly what's happened at that Chimish, where I did. We had those two excavations early in the 20th century. It wasn't excavated anymore. But then in 1990, Shlomo and Steve decided, let's go back. The development of the archaeological methods and tools in that 80-year period, approximately, or not quite 80, 70, 65, was astounding. And they're discovering much more about the city and how people live with excavating just a portion of what they had in the early 20th century. So that's one of the main reasons archaeologists don't dig the entire site. So when you say, we didn't find it, so it must not happen, well, I haven't excavated everything. The evidence that one's looking for, maybe, could be over there. Not here, like you were saying. Yeah. Premature confirmations. I have a whole lecture I give in one of my classes on this. Uh, misuse of archaeology. Okay, how many times, I asked this before, but how many times has Noah's Ark been discovered? And every few years we get reports out about the Ark has been discovered. 
Well, it's moved around a lot, hasn't it? Because they're not all in the same place. Well, okay, that's just something I think we need to be careful about. It's not saying it didn't happen, it's just a matter of let's be aware that there are people who are searching in order to prove something. And when they find something that they think might be, then they tell the world. And the might be very quickly becomes, yes it is. And as other archaeologists and scholars start looking at the evidence and the data, they say, it isn't. The Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones wasn't the first. But actually, there's people in Ethiopia that claim they have it. Church. They won't let anyone in to see it. They won't take any pictures of it, but they say we have it. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there's debates on where these cities were located. And um, the scholars go back and forth. Some scholars have denied it ever happened, but then other scholars who accept the idea of it happening, they still disagree on where. And there's a lot of evidence and such in two or three different places down south and east of the Dead Sea. The site of the crossing of the Red Sea, I'm going to speed up because there's a whole lot more I want to share with you. Location of Sinai. Okay, you can take a tour of Mount Sinai. An honest tour, a tour guide will tell you, we don't really know exactly. Yeah. It's just in this area. But then others say, no, it's clear across over in modern day um, Saudi Arabia. So, differences. And it, it's interesting to kind of find our way through a lot of these discussions to try to figure out, but we really don't know. You may have heard, you know, the ossuary of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the burial box and all of that. That's had a fascinating history. That's still undecided. It never will be officially decided. There was about a 10-year court case over this. The Israeli Antiquities Authority took the owner of this to court saying, you manufactured this. Okay, it's an old burial box, it's a stone box, but you're the one who carved the name on the side. James, the brother of Jesus, son of Joseph. He denied that. And in Israel, court cases like that are decided by the judge, not a jury. And all the judge decided was the state did not prove its case. In other words, the state did not prove it's a faith. Okay, what does that mean? Legally, that's where it is. They didn't prove it's a faith. Still could be. Of course, the guy that owns it said, no, it isn't. But that debate just goes on. It will. Uh, another archaeologist uh, claims to have found the cave of John the Baptist where he lived and where he worked and all of that. But there's not a whole lot in that cave. I've been there and there wasn't any artifacts in there through this case. It just kind of a couple of footprints and a stone. He says this is where people stood when he baptized them. You get all kinds of things. So, where is the ark? Take a tour here. So, with that, you know, if you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, the Word of God, and you're trying to use this, trying to discern what you're hearing and what you're reading, when it's maybe premature, how do you discern what you're reading is accurate or not? Or how, how would you go about that? Well, there are plenty of examples like um, in the Gospel of John where um, archaeology has proven a good bit about John and his accuracy in terms of um, the land of Israel, the practices of the Jews, other Gospels as well. Uh, archaeology does not prove theology. It can't. Yeah. It just can't. There are two different yeah. parallel universes. But it can provide a very good perspective of how the Gospel authors and even Old Testament authors present what they're saying in an accurate historical cultural context or description of the history and culture and so forth. 
And to me, that's more important than trying to um, camp out on any one of these particular things because these are all over the page in terms of discussion and perspectives and that's a never-ending discussion there. So it's the more general for me that's, that's more, most important. Okay, you remember the Ark of the Covenant story of that. Take it into battle and it's captured in Aphek. The Philistines capture it, they take it down to Ashdod, Gath, Ekron. Nobody wants it. No, you take it. No, you take it. All kinds of things were happening. So they put it on an ox cart here at Ekron and sent it down with Sorek Valley. Beth Shemesh is on the border between the Philistines and uh, the Israelites. And uh, that's where the ox cart stops. The idea was that when the ox, oxen who are pulling the cart stop, then we'll leave it. That's theirs. In other words, the Philistines were saying, take it back. So this is the Sword Valley. And where we dig is right here. And this is looking west to the Mediterranean. This city, Necron, the last city that the Ark of the Covenant was in, uh, is just right around the bend here. And this is the valley that that Ark of the Covenant came down. And when it got to Beth Shemesh, it stopped. People were working in the fields when they looked up and realized what it was. They had a tremendous celebration. They had a sacrifice um, and all of that. Ekron, the Philistine city, was right over here. Another Philistine village, Timnah, right here, Samson wanted to marry somebody from there. This is the area Samson lived in. In fact, Zorah was Samson's hometown. And I'm standing right here on the top of our tell, taking that picture. And uh, the Dale Manor was that similar, but his was better. So this is where uh, Samson was born. Much of his activities was in this valley pushing the Philistine back. Back on this map here, just a second, where the Ark of the Covenant ended up after they had this sacrifice at Beth Shemesh. Too many people looked into the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, disaster there. They sent it all. And they put it in storage, so to speak. In Kiryat Yarim, which is the modern city of Abu Ghosh. One of my favorite places to be, to relax. It's an Arab village, and uh, on Friday nights, often, or Saturday nights, we'll go over there to uh, one of my favorite places, the Lebanese restaurant. We started eating at um, this place, and first time we were there, I said, do you want a salad? Okay. This was the salad. Yeah. Huge. We don't order salad anymore. <laughs> but one of the most curious places, it's an Arab village. It's just about five miles down the road from Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> there's a Catholic church there. We were sitting out, there, there's a sidewalk out front here one night. We were sitting out there just looking up the hill. Statue of Mary on top of the church here. Uh, there's a, uh, a Muslim mosque there in town, down in the valley. Uh, there's a crusade, beautiful crusade church. We were in there one time and people were singing. Yeah, just gorgeous singing. But sitting out on that sidewalk, looking up the Arab town, in a Jewish country, looking at a Catholic church, knowing there's a mosque just around the corner. If you go around the other corner, there's a restaurant called Elvis. Yes, this is the statue of Elvis. <laughs> About an eight foot tall statue of Elvis. Oh, oh life size. <laughs> you go in, all they play is Elvis music. All they serve are cheeseburgers. 
<laughs> Obviously, it's an Arab restaurant, not a Jewish. They don't serve cheeseburgers. Um, but really, a very fun place to be, very relaxing after a hard, long week. We were sitting here one evening, and all of a sudden we heard gunshots. And we started looking around, wanted to crawl under the table, and there were a lot of gunshots. Nobody was doing anything. They just kept eating. Waiters kept coming by. They saw us looking really nervous, so one of the waiters came over and said, It's okay. It's okay. It's a wedding. We're <laughs> celebrating. But man, we heard gunshots that's going on all over the place. And in Israel, hearing gunshots, we were wondering, okay, is it the end? But really a fun place. Um, <clears throat> Abu Ghosh is uh, a little over halfway from Bet Shemesh to Jerusalem. But that's where the Ark of the Covenant was before it went to Jerusalem, before it was taken there. Bet Shemesh is on the border, as I said, between Philistia and Judah. This is in the area of low hill country called uh, Shvela. This is where Samson was from. Most of those stories about Samson deal with the Philistines pushing them back because the Philistines want to move inland. And he's, as a judge, military leader, though he likes to work on his own, pushes them back. His battle is with the Philistines as they're trying to encroach. And this is where Beth Shemesh is. His hometown is just across the valley. <clears throat> Okay, some very interesting things coming up here. This is what we call the South Balk. This is on the northern edge of the Tell. And we have been excavating here for several years, back up to this um, balk. Big one, as you can see. <laughs> These are balks, but much smaller. Okay, we just decided we'd use that kind of a division point. We'd only go that far. This is one of the things, I'll get back to that story in a minute. But as we dig, we're digging down, and at the top is the most recent. Uh, Bed Chemish was not occupied uh, after um, the Assyrians were in power. Sennacherib is here. He probably is one that kind of put the final touches on Bed Chemish, but there were a uh, few more inhabitants after Sennacherib. That was a level one. Sennacherib there at level two. And just go on down, and uh, we've uncovered up to what we think is level 10, little bronze uh, gate, not only on the south, where I showed you on that map, but on the north too, uh, the fortification wall there. We're back down uh, to the middle of the Canaanite period. Uh, this is the period of time when uh, the Israelites would have come in somewhere between levels four and seven. These are very difficult to distinguish one from the other. And it's very difficult to distinguish in a village like this, Canaanite occupation from Israelite occupation. Um, how do you tell an Israelite from a Canaanite? That's not a joke. Uh, sometimes. You, may, you won't find big bones, it won't be the need, you won't find big bones in an Israelite city. But then some of the Canaanites didn't need a whole lot of dig either. That's one of the determining factors, but not the only one. Okay, that walk I showed you, as we were digging, uh, by the time 2007, 2009 came along, we found a lot of fascinating things right here in this area. Um, scarab. Well, I've got pictures of those in a second. In that same area, this is where all that stuff came from I just showed you. Huge destruction area. As we dig, dug more over this area, more destruction uh, evidence came out. A lot of burned brick down in this area. Uh, this was in a corner of a room and um, these jars still had seeds in them storage jars. Really interesting to see. They did uh, C-14 testing of those. Mud bricks for the wall that had fallen over. 
that's a meter stick. It's kind of give you an idea. Some of those mud bricks are pretty good size, you can see. Uh, but they had fallen over, and just the whole area. In this area, we found several things like this, a little plaque that was only about uh, four inches tall, uh, ceramic. And uh, we think, at least the directors think, that uh, this is a queen. It has kind of an Egyptian motif to it, but a queen from this area whose name was uh, Ninur Makmesh. And there is in the Amarna letters, these are letters sent from Canaanite communities to Egypt. Say, we're being invaded here. We're being attacked here. We need your help. Egypt ignored them. But one of the letters was from a queen. Didn't just her name was mentioned, but not where she was queen. And our directors and some others have corroborated with them on this are suggesting that this plaque found at Beth Shemesh is that queen. And that she was actually queen of Beth Shemesh. And there's some interesting uh, <clears throat> articles being written about that very thing, which if, it's, if they can prove that, then this would be a fascinating part of the story of uh, Beth Shemesh. And this is one of the letters uh, may the king, my lord, know war has been waged in the land. Gone is the land of the king, the king being Pharaoh. Um, and the upper room. Now, some people used to say those were the Hebrews, but I'm not sure that's the case. But the idea is they're being invaded, they're being attacked, and they need help. Uh, they didn't get it. Uh, and some are wondering if this destruction level we're talking about was then that period by these people. Uh, this was the scarab, not very large, you can see just someone's holding it in their fingers. And on the, uh, this side, we sent it to an expert, he interpreted it for us, it says, Amenhotep, beloved of Ray. Ray was the sun god. And so we can date that. This came to Beth Shemesh, how? We have no idea, but sometime after 1352 B.C. Uh, so, and this is a little after that time that we dated it with uh, some C14 dating and those uh, seeds and uh, pottery style and so forth, it fits in that period of time. A little small alabaster vessel, it's only about this high tall, you can see it's rather okay. And uh, there's only one parallel that's ever been discovered up in Syria, an ancient seaport in the gardens. Two Cups that are Minoan. <laughs> that shows. <laughs> in fact, when these pictures were circulated in the academic world, the expert on Minoan pottery from Crete got a hold of our directors and said, What in the world are you doing with these? She had been uh, excavating writing articles and things about these are very special cups. Never has a cup been found this complete. The only thing near it is about a third of a cup found in the palace of Kenosis, in the palace of the king. And she said, I can't tell you how jealous I am well, these are almost complete. We've gone back two or three times trying to find that little sliver there. <laughs> How did this get to that change? Extremely rare. In fact, these are the only known examples. Well, we finally decided we're dealing with a palace of some sort. A wealthy family who lived in this location that has been given this as a gift travel, brought it back, um, as well as these things, very rare. And in this one place, right here, in this one room, we found all these things. Those cups, all of these bowls, chalices,
over here is one room that had all those mud brick, burnt mud bricks earlier. So all of these were found. One room, storage room. Intact? No. Okay. They had to be reconstructed. All these chalices are for ritual type activities, celebrations. This was the room. And stay in slow mo. Uh, proud daddies there. <laughs> so all of these were discovered in the same general area that butts right up against that ball. So what was the decision? Bye bye bye. <laughs> Hopefully there's more in here. So we go back up here and dig down. But before we do that, other things we found in that same area, but before we found all those other things. So it was at a higher level. After that destruction had occurred, after that palace had been destroyed, the higher level, we find these. This is what is called a foundation deposit right inside um, the doorway of the building. It's a lamp with a bowl over we found several. One summer I found three along one wall. They use these foundation deposits, uh, Canaanite, a little later type, uh, time period, for uh, kind of special blessings of a new building, dedicating a new building. Uh, some traditions have, you know, where you, you scare out the uh, evil demons from the corners and such. And this was kind of what that was. Land with the boat. In addition to that area, I and a buddy from Alabama was digging and we found these two bones sticking up. Our first inclination was to pick them up. We didn't. It was good because we kept digging and found a donkey burial. <coughs> On that same level, just across the threshold of the same door where that foundation deposit had been discovered. Hmm, something's going on. Found this odd thing. I was standing right next to the guy who found that. He found it. He was using a pickaxe. But that hole. I told him, don't use that. You shouldn't be using that here. And just as I said that, he finds it. Cracks it. Should have been using just a, a hand pick. Nevertheless, here, 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 what that looked like is this. Extremely rare, a very long stand for a chalice. Not many at all have been discovered like that. But all of that right in this close proximity, very same level, right above the level of all that destruction. Probably what this is all about is after the destruction, build it in to rebuild. But because of what all was underneath, they felt they needed to dedicate the new building, bury a donkey, which Canaanites did. They have found these in Egypt, ritual burials uh, for protection, for blessings, for different kinds of things. Um, and then chalice being used in that ceremony perhaps. This is also for protection from evil spirits and things. Because what's under the ground, you know, all that destruction, all that evil that was caused by enemies, they want to cover it up, be done with it. Start fresh. Was it a grown donkey or a young one? Uh, we thought at first, we called it Herman. Thought he was male, we found out female. Mm -hmm. Who was expected? So not young, maybe a couple of years old. The back had been broken in two or three places, which is consistent with donkey sacrifices. We placed very carefully, as you can see. Yeah. You say the donkey was buried. Does that, if they bury something, does that go down into the lower level? You say this is all on the same level. But if the donkey was buried, does it put it at a lower level, or is it just like covered in dirt outside the door or something? 
I don't know how deep it would have been at the, from the level they were starting, but it wasn't very much deeper than the foundation deposit, just right across over here. A little bit deeper, but probably not very much into that lower destruction level. So as we were cleaning it out, after taking all the bones out, we didn't see any of the destruction layer. It's probably just above that. And I suspect there's a layer about like that or so between the destruction layer and the new one. Yeah. Did uh, Hittite people use young donkeys to make covenants? Also? I'm not sure. They may have. It wasn't that rare in the ancient world for donkey sacrifices for covenants and these kinds of things, dedications and so forth. They found other, they found several other donkey burials in different places. Not just the Canaanites. Egypt, I know. Perhaps the Hittites. So, we go back up on top. That's where we found all this fascinating stuff. Go back on top. <clears throat> set up our shade. That's one of my responsibilities for the whole site to have shade. Um, <clears throat> some days I spend half a day doing that and half a day digging. and Then half a day supervising. <laughs> Feels like a day and a half. <clears throat> in two years, we start finding things. This actually, originally, we think had been a full circular installation. And some of you have seen these pictures before. We think we have a temple. Now, what are we trying to dig down to? That palace. But in the meantime, we take a detour. We find a palace. Okay, we're not going to just get rid of the palace to find the, or the temple to find the palace, we stop here because this, see this is where we had been digging, we move up here, these are two squares, which is what this whole thing is, two squares across, and about five squares east to west, and lo and behold we find this, this is what we've been doing the last three or four years, back to this layer, these layers. That's in the temple. That's this wall right here. So we're wondering, what in the world are these layers? So Sean spends a whole day pain, painlessly. Well, it wasn't painless, but she was painstaking. There you go. Labeling each one, taking samples of each one, taking them to a lab that very day. She couldn't wait. She gets back to the caboose late that night. Animal dung. Almost every layer, animal dung. Straw. You think what happened was the temple is covered over. New people move in, new people invade. They don't want that temple anymore, so they cover it up and they use it for an animal pen. Makes several layers going up. To do away with the you know the ancient temple that was there. That's the only explanation that we can find or can think of at this point. These are part of the temple the stone, the sacrifice stone. See, we document them very carefully. Sample 37, 38, 36, and so forth. That was our crew that year. And those stones are very interesting, but the story goes on. <coughs> um, <coughs> these are some of them. Examples of pottery we found right around this middle stone. Behind this uh, one, two, three, third stone um, was one of my areas I worked in. Just bags and bags and bags full of animal bones. And then these kinds of uh, pottery reconstructed, it looked like this. Very rare. These are not the kind of pots and pans and dishes you use in the kitchen. 
This is a double rim pot, which is very rare. Some of the markings on them are very rare. Most likely from a ritual setting of some sort around this middle stone. Animal bones are back here. Bags and bags full of them. The stone's right here. And then this one you see has a circle around it and then indentation in the middle. Maybe for some sort of liquid and then a drain spout there. So lots of fascinating things. Here's that bulk. And then just two, three years later, it's gone. Right behind there. In this area, we found a little, uh, it's not a scarab, but it's a seal. Right here. It, it's out of stone, I'm not exactly sure what stone, but see the carving on it? They call it the Samson seal. Because it looks like you've got a man standing in front of a four-footed animal with a long tail. Mm -hmm. Our our directors are not what we'd call believers. They respect the Bible, but they say this is the right picture. Right place. Samson lived here in this area at the right time. It is from the time right after Samson. Now, does that prove anything? Not other than there were stories circulating in this place not long after the lifetime of Samson about this kind of and we've actually found one other almost exactly like this. Not as a good condition, but almost the very same picture. Also found a really fascinating uh, olive press here. And in the bottom of that olive press, we found some very impressive Philistine pottery. It's hard to see because um, it was stained so badly that this is a bird. This is typical of Philistine style birds and spirals, and that's what we found here. Reconstructed, we'll I think we have a picture of reconstruction later, but what we did, we dug down all around it, and it started disassembling that. <coughs> Excuse me. Taking samples, ash, we found a lot of uh, olive pits in here. And uh, these stones plus the base, the base was huge. That's where the back one comes in. If it went any other way, we were going to get those things out. I have no idea how they got them in. We still can't figure out how do they get these stones in there. Because this is a very large, flat stone, which is the base of the, uh, the olive press. So there are times when the backhoe is useful. Now, that's where that olive press was. This is where the temple is. Is there a connection? We've been wondering. We don't know. Okay, all the press is gone. Excavated a little more. That's where the temple is. But what we found two summers ago. A little channel. Looks like it's going from underneath the temple to where that olive press used to be. The olive press may have been built on top of it at a later period, probably was. But this is one of our next mysteries. What is this? And this next summer we'll clear all this out to try to establish a connection, if there is one, between these two. And back to this, this is the wall of the temple. We dug down further. But as you look at it, We're wondering if there was an early temple and then another later one built on top of it. Because this one, you see the foundation only goes to here. This one, the foundation or the wall comes all the way over here. In a little different pattern. See, that's one of the things 
that you use to help with your archaeological work is questions. What is this? What's the connection? Is there any? And we were wondering, because on the other side of this wall, but this time we'd only dug down to the same level. But two summers ago, we dug down further, and there was more wall there, a little different pattern. So we're wondering if there's an early temple and then a late temple. <clears throat> Back to the drone, Captain. This is right above the temple. The temple's there. We have one here, a series of cobblestones uh, here and here, um, and these trough looking like things in here. We're wondering if that's a horse uh, barn, stable, and feeding trough. Well, we couldn't leave that very long because we're trying to dig down further here to see if this temple goes further back in here. This is where all that was found. Those, uh, these right here. So, we took off about half of that two summers ago and dug down. Okay, here's the outline of the temple. Our next step, does this wall continue through here to meet this wall? If so, that's the parameter of our temple. We don't know if this wall, something's happened here, but we don't know if this wall connects to that. We'll find out next summer. And all of a sudden last summer we came across this huge stone. We don't know how big it is, but it looks like it might be what we call a stella, a stone that stands up. We can't wait to see if there's anything on the other side of that. We're hoping there is a carving of some sort. I have no idea. <clears throat> but it just gets more interesting every year there. It really does. Archaeology is about mystery. And what's happening there, what's going on. And this little channel there, see how it's covered there? That's a question. This is a question. So let me go back and have a better picture. This is a question. Does this wall continue? And this wall. If so, then that looks like that's the parameter of our temple. And we'll clear out all of this. It'll take a while, but those are mysteries that we work on in the shade. That's kind of difficult when there's a channel like that because you don't know that something was built under the temple or something was built over the palace. You know, right. Just, yep. Glad you mentioned the palace because as we were digging further to go back in, we lost the trail of the palace. We don't know because we've dug down to that level now, and it's just like, poof, no evidence. Don't know what's happened to it, but that's a very good point, yeah. Where did they get the water? There was a brook not too far from here to the north. Uh, later, um, about the 8th century or so, they dug a huge cistern. But before that, they had what they called bell cisterns around smaller wells that uh, catch water. But, yeah. Do you have a yeah uh, tell folks what you do between the seasons with the site. Do you cover it? Do you sandbag it? Do you tarp it? Do you leave um, it? <clears throat> around the parameter on this side, see, stakes. We put a barbed wire fence up. Sometimes, like that. Uh, um, olive press. We didn't want to leave it just open. So we put sand after a uh, wheelbarrow full of wheelbarrow full of sand one after the other just filled the level. Which meant the first thing we did the next season <laughs> empty that thing out. <laughs> but basically we just leave it. In the Ottoman period 
Um, when archaeologists worked in Israel, the law was at the end of the season, you covered everything back up. But not anymore. Not enough rainfall to be an issue. Not tremendously. Every, every year we have, we see evidence of um, um, <clears throat> rain and, yeah. um, you know, washing stuff down, but it hasn't really been serious. Up in Galilee, it would be, because they get a lot of rain together. Yeah. Uh, but this is on the side of the hill. So a lot of things wash down from up here, down there. And the first couple of days, two or three days every season, we have to kind of go through and clean up. And we can see stuff that's washed down, but we don't know where it came from, so we really can't use it for dating or anything. Yes? Um, when this was occupied by Israel, which, which tribe was it in this area? Did you or came? Uh, this specific city was um, a Levite city. They went to the property? No. So. Uh, I don't remember what tribe. I'd have to look at a map to see the tribe there at the area. Good question. I don't know that. Samson. He was from yeah, just across the valley. So it might not have been the same in that general area for sure from Dan. Okay. Anything else? Do you have, do you have objectives like when you go back next year? Do you have a certain goal that you guys have all talked about you want to get done, or is it just kind of see how far you get? Well, those questions I was telling you about, yeah. those will be our first objectives. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think the bearings here. How long does that take, though? Here? Is, is that a whole... Clear this out, because our primary objective right now is to figure out the parameters of this temple, yeah. and also the relationship with this channel. Two, two years ago, our main objective was to trace that palace, which was uh, down here, as far back as we can. We got to here, and we just haven't found any more. If we go down a little further, we might, but yeah, that was one of the main objectives two years ago. And we satisfied our, our questions enough to say, okay, well, it doesn't continue. And then other, other crews working here, yeah, that takes a long time to move that, that kind of soil. That's a big bulk. It's about half as tall as it used to be. We moved it, cut it down about half two summers ago. We still have it. But you have to be more careful how you do that. We don't bring the backhoe back for this. <laughs> we don't bring the backhoe back. <laughs> What is the distance of those walls you're wanting to find out? You've got a wall going across at the top and Here? a wall at the bottom, yeah. And okay. the one at the bottom. Um, these squares, concrete squares, five meters apart from one another. From here to here is five meters. Here to here is five meters. Even though they're not on the same level, there to there is five meters, here to here is five meters. So that kind of gives you an idea. 16 or so. Yeah, 16. 16 and a half. Yeah, half feet or so. A rod. Well, I appreciate For your attendance rod. and hope that uh, if you didn't have time to visit the museum tonight, if you haven't before, come back sometime. What are the hours? Generally in the afternoons. One to five Tuesday through Friday and then one to four on Saturday. Okay. And these lectures we're trying to do every fall in conjunction with the museum. And then in the spring, uh, around five to the March. Roughly, we have a dinner. And we're looking for that announcement. But, uh, appreciate your interest and um, keep Mark these wife Vicky in your prayers. Uh, Mark really wanted to be here, but he just couldn't because of family health problems. And uh, keep him in your prayers, if you will, his wife especially. Anything else before we close?